Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, event that I know lots of you are looking forward to. Um, look, there have been many challenges for us over the last few years, um, and there are much more ahead as the world experiences the lingering effects of the pandemic and, of course, the cost of living crisis with inflation and everything else. <clears throat> Um, in fact, changes all around us. I was at a debate at Westminster last night about what the metaverse is going to do to us all, and no one could agree on that. So, you know, uncertainty remains the flavour of the day, I think. But look, I've got a few things I want to run through before I, I hand over to Les. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, thank Les rather, for agreeing to share all of this research with our global audience, and also Adam and Eve DDB, who've kindly partnered with us to bring you this event. The session is being recorded and the slides will be available. The link to both will be shared with you after the event. So onto the agenda for today. Um, this webinar will be divided into two parts. Uh, Les will start by looking uh, back at the last three years and how the pandemic has impacted consumer markets. He'll then take any questions you have. So by the way, as uh, Les speaks, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to post any questions, and we'll refer back to those after the uh, first session breaks. So he'll do that and take some questions after that session. Uh, and then he'll be looking forward to what's ahead and crucially how brands and agencies can thrive as we continue to move into ever more uncertain times. Again, yeah. as we're taking questions, so use the Q&A function as the second section goes through. By the way, at the end of the first section, when we dealt with some of the questions, we'll have a short comfort break. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, escape, uh, take any calls, uh, do anything you need to do before we come back after a few minutes. So that's all from me. I want to hand over to Les now, uh, and I'm looking forward, as I'm sure you all are, to what he has to say. Over to you, Les. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning, everyone. Um, so in this first section, which I've called The World Turned Upside Down, I'm gonna be talking about what's been happening to the economy over the last two to three years. I'm gonna be talking about trends that affect the whole world, but, a lot of the data that you'll see on the screen is UK data because that's the stuff I have most easy access to to illustrate the trends. But um, pretty much everything I'm going to say this morning applies in some form or another to, I think, most developed economies. So here we go. Um, the extraordinary turmoil that we've seen over the last two to three years obviously has its root in one thing and that's covid the worst pandemic for over a hundred years um i think when covid first started to rumble around the world uh, at the end of 2019 going into 2020 some people thought that it might just be like a flu outbreak i certainly know people who who talked like that at the beginning I think we now realise that it was something extraordinarily serious, not even a once in a lifetime event. It's a once in a century event. The official death toll globally is about 6.4 million. Um, but that actually is a massive underestimate. Um, the Economist magazine has built a large mathematical model which allows them to measure the true level of incremental deaths around the world. And their conclusion is that the total number of incremental de deaths is more like 22 million so far. Um, the official death toll dramatically underestimates the true number of deaths. Furthermore, their models suggest that in the first year alone, vaccines prevented a further 20 million deaths. So without swift intervention from scientists and governments, we'd be looking at a death toll that was pushing up towards 45 million. Now, how does that compare with other major tragedies of the last 100 years? Well, in this chart, what I've done is I've compared those COVID deaths against all the major world wars in, around the world since World War I. And you can see quite clearly that COVID dwarfs every war since the First World War, um, apart from World War II. The only war that's bigger than, than in the death toll uh, than COVID is, was World War II. Um, it also dwarfs all the major health tragedies of the last hundred years, 
apart from two. Spanish flu in 1918, immediately after the First World War, and the AIDS epidemic of the last 30 years or so. Um, of course, AIDS is, um, was a, has been a massive health problem for the world, but it's rumbled along over 30 years. Those COVID deaths, 22 2 million or so, came in within two years. So in terms of um, immediate, rapid uh, tragedy, there's really only two things that, that rival it, and that's the Spanish flu pandemic of 100 years ago and World War II. Um, in response to that extraordinary tragedy, we've seen the biggest quarantine effort in world history. Nothing has ever been done quite like the combined uh, quarantines and lockdowns that we've seen around the world um, over the last few years, and which are still going on in, for example, parts of China. That changed many things. It changed how people traveled, how they worked, how they shopped, what they buy, and so on. And we're going to look at some of those trends. Um, this chart from the um, UK uh, Office for National Statistics shows travel by all modes within the UK from 1952 up to 2020. And you can see we've never seen a drop in passenger miles like the drop that we saw in 2020. Um, not only that, the mix of modes of travel changed enormously. People began to shy away from public transport. They stopped using trains. They stopped using buses, preferring cars, uh, bicycles and journeys on foot. They started working from home, which meant journeys became shorter and more local with more cycling, more walking, uh, more short hops. Um, what we saw is that the mix of people traveling changed. We saw that people in office jobs, people who had, had white collar desk jobs, were quite likely to be working from home, so they didn't travel very much. Whereas people in manual jobs or you know, cleaners and um, people in blue collar jobs maybe didn't have the option to do that, so they kept traveling. That meant uh, for the more expensive modes of travel associated with business travel and more affluent users like rail travel and, and air travel um, saw really big drops in, in, in passenger miles, whereas, for example, buses didn't, didn't uh, uh, see such a big hit. Um, the biggest drop of all was in international air travel. Um, so we've seen uh, all kinds of uh, international travel have dropped, air travel particularly, particularly business travel. Um, in general, business, business travel in all modes, national and international, has, has, has dropped and still hasn't come back to normal. Um, the fact that we're doing this presentation online is a symptom of that. Um, so commuter journeys have, have, have dropped away and not come back to normal. Um, business travel has dropped away and not come back to normal. And um, international leisure travel has dropped away and, and is still not back to normal. We're maybe still only at about 63% uh, of um, international air travel. So that massive quarantine effort and the associated uh, changes in the way people move about um, caused huge disruptions in the supply side of the global economy. Um, throughout my career, I've seen uh, global su supply chains become longer, more co complicated and more finely tuned. Um, in the old days, manufacturers would keep um, uh, large stocks of, of, of supplies and, uh, and, and finished goods in warehouses, often near to factories. It was all quite uh, short supply chains with lots of inventory. Now we have long supply chains, which are very lean with just-in-time manufacturing, which means that, that it's like an incredibly delicate machine and COVID smashed it. Um, this chart shows an overall measure of supply chain pressure, the disruptions to the world supply chain. And you can see how when COVID hit in 2020, suddenly we, we saw um, factories closing, we saw offices closing, we saw ports disrupted, 
Um, and um, that meant that uh, supplies of many goods and materials and parts uh, were, was, were disrupted. Uh, delivery times started to lengthen. I'm sure you'll all remember those pictures of container ships um, parked at anchor in the sea outside um, ports in America, unable to get in because, uh, because the ports were too clogged. Part of the problem there was also a, a huge shift, as you'll see, from uh, services to goods in the way that people consume things, um, which the world's factories were not ready for. Um, people started buying more goods at just the point at which factories and ports were unable to deliver them. So that caused the first supply chain shock. Then as things began to ease, we had a second wave of supply chain pressure caused by a surge in consumption, caused by delayed consumption, as you'll see, and then exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, which um, put pressure on many of the raw materials that go into manufacturing. So we've not seen this kind of uh, disruption of, of global supply chains ever since people uh, began to move towards just-in-time manufacturing. It's the first really big test of the new global economy. Um, and to some extent, it has not, I wouldn't say failed, but it has, has, has revealed weaknesses in, the, in this new global world. We've seen, seen a huge change in the way people work. Um, many of us, most of us, I would guess, um, were working at home for some time, and many of us still do. Um, Google mobility data allows us to track where people are during the day and what's going on. And you can see that as soon as COVID hit, as soon as we went into lockdown, people were spending a, a much more time at home, much less time in the workplace. And while there has been something of a drift back, it hasn't gone back to normal. Now, um, measuring the true, uh, if you like, how many people are in the office is, is a surprisingly hard thing to do, even with this kind of mobility data. Um, I have a favorite little nugget of data that I discovered during the course of this research, which is spending in workplace canteens, which is pretty much a measure of how many people are in the office at lunchtime. Um, and um, in the UK, at least, that is still 50% down on the pre-pandemic uh, level. Now, interestingly, I presented this chart earlier in the week and somebody then sent me um, a report from the Lord Mayor of London's office, a very detailed report on um, office capacity in London and office usage in London. And they concluded uh, exactly the same figure, that um, London is still only 50% back, is still 50% below its pre-COVID level. Um, that, uh, according to the report, um, we're ahead of New York. New York is still not as uh, um, back up to the 50% level and slightly behind Paris. Um, so probably we're more or less typical for, for, for big developed economies. And I think you can see in that chart that the return to work has slowed down. It's not, it doesn't look like we're going to be going back to normal anytime soon. And um, in many companies, uh, some of the big banks, for example, have shed office space. They've downsized office space. Some of the some firms are shifting to a policy where uh, you actually have to request to come into the office. Other companies are playing it differently. But what's clear is that hybrid working is not going to go away. And that has shifted, accelerated a shift that was already happening towards digital ways of working and living and shopping and so forth. Um, you can see that, for example, in web conferencing traffic, which was always a thing to some extent before the pandemic, but is, has been completely transformed. We all are comfortable with using Zoom and Teams and so on. Um, you can also see it in the shopping behavior. Um, online shopping has been around for a very long time. Um, many of us have been doing it for 20 to 25 years. But the growth of online shopping has been 
surprisingly slow. Um, online shopping only reached about 10% of uh, UK retail sales um, in around about 2013. To put that in context, catalogue shopping used to be about 10% of retail sales um, in the 1970s. So online shopping only, only got as big as catalogue shopping relatively recently. But as you can see, COVID suddenly accelerated to the trend towards online shopping. Um, and my estimate is that it's accelerated that trend by about maybe seven or eight years, but maybe more. Um, as well as changing the way we work and the way we shop, um, the shift towards the home has changed the way we consume media. Um, we've seen a big increase in consumption of video in all its forms. This is data from the IPA's excellent touchpoint survey, one of the a few surveys I know of that measures consumption of all media on a light for light basis using a mobile panel. Um, and as you can see, uh, the latest waves, the last three waves of the Touchpoint survey show how, as we went into lockdown, consumption of all forms of video increased, including an increase in viewing of traditional TV, live and recorded TV, um, increase in broadcaster VOD, so T live and recorded TV from broadcasters is the green layer, broadcaster VOD, the black layer, um, a significant increase, as everyone knows, in, in uh, subscriber VOD, the purple layer, and also increases in other forms of video, including, um, for example, YouTube. Um, that has fallen back a bit uh, since lockdown ended. What's clear is video consumption has remained higher than it was. Um, uh, even TV is, is, is good old traditional TV is a, is a higher level than it was pre-pandemic. Um, now, um, obviously, the, big in, the, the most um, well-known increase is the increase in streaming. So uh, companies like Netflix and Disney Plus have done very well, or at least did. Uh, uh, during the um, that surge, uh, circa lockdown, um, and also uh, some uh, investors got wrong-footed when uh, when when that surge proved to be a, a temporary surge, and we saw that in uh, wobbles around uh, Netflix's share price, and then also um, Netflix's then decision to start taking uh, uh, carrying advertising. So, in effect, Netflix becomes um, a TV company like any other, really. Um, and uh, I think it's quite interesting then to put that in perspective. Now that Netflix is audited by Barb uh, in the UK, we can see how Netflix compares to other TV channels. Apologies to non-UK viewers, but I think um, in many markets, you'll see similar uh, numbers in the sense that Netflix, yes, is ma massive, but in terms of its share of audience, it is only the third biggest TV channel. The BBC is still way the biggest, followed by ITV. Netflix is just slightly bigger than Channel 4 in the UK. Um, so it comes in as a significant TV channel, but not the main one. Um, and Amazon and Disney are, when you look at it in this way, still relatively small players in terms of video viewing. Um, and this is the kind of way we're going to have to start to think about Netflix and Amazon, and Disney and all the streamers in future as basically TV channels in another form. Um, as um, somebody said at Thinkbox, uh, TV isn't dead. It's just had babies. What about other media? Well, I haven't got time to go over them all, but um, what we've seen is that um, exposure to outdoor has fallen um, because People are not moving about in quite the way they were. It fell dramatically during lockdown, but it is still lower than it was. And, and particularly in city centres, of course, where people are no longer commuting in so much. Cinema uh, plunged to zero during lockdown in the UK because cinema, cinemas were shut and it hasn't fully recovered. But the trend that I think is most significant and which has not been paid most uh, enough attention to is that... Um, consumption of social media in total has fallen 
and in fact was falling before the pandemic and that trend has continued i have been saying this for a couple of years and i don't think many people seem to have noticed but we according to the data i've seen we hit peak social media a couple of years ago um i think the reason for that is that young people are doing different things with their phone phones um, as well as social media they are also watching more online video so they're watching netflix more on their phones they're watching youtube more on their phones but they're also listening to more music on their phones the decline of social media consumption correlates with the rise of spotify quite dramatically um, i could talk about that more but we haven't got time the pandemic has changed uh patterns of spending in all sorts of unexpected ways i think it's useful to think of it in four quadrants. First of all, there were the things that people cut back on temporarily through the pandemic. For example, people stopped going to cafes, restaurants and hotels because they couldn't go out. Um, they spent less on clothes and shoes and jewellery and watches because they weren't going out and they couldn't show them off. Um, then there were the things that they increased consumption of and kept spending more on. People have, are spending much more time at home now, and that hasn't gone back to normal. So they're spending more, more on for food and drink at home. They're spending more on the home environment, buying, renting, improving homes. Lots of people have got pets. Um, um, lots of people have got dogs, for example. Um, also, a lot of stuff on, to do with health and self-improvement. Um, people buying exercise bikes and road bikes and spending more on training and education and taking up uh, musical instruments, for instance. Um, they spent more on top technology. They bought a lot of laptops and gaming machines. They're shopping more online and they're shopping more locally. Then there were lasting cuts in spending. Spending on travel, particularly spending on travel relating, related to work and business and international travel. Those things have not gone back to normal. And I suspect will never go quite back to normal because we've all got used to um, hybrid working, online working and so on. Um, then there's a whole load of things to do with travel, for example, paper newspapers, which are often associated with the commute. Intriguingly, people don't seem to be upgrading their mobile phones as often as they used to. And I don't quite know why, but it may be something to do with spending more time on the desktop and less time uh, in, in company where, where, where people are showing off their flash new mobiles. Um, my favourite bit of data, spending on narcotics and prostitution. I did not know that the UK government measured that, which means that those things contribute to the, to the UK GDP figures. Um, intriguing stuff. Um, um, and many other things. And then there are a, a, a couple of categories where, uh, where people um, uh, briefly spent more. Um, there are only two significant ones in the UK data. Um, spending on fish, as in buying fish to eat, and musical instruments. And uh, some of you might want to guess why those are the, the only two. Um, uh, I, I do have an answer, but see if you can figure it out. Um, okay, so huge change in the mix of consumer spending. Consumer spending itself dropped a lot. Um, if you look at the um, uh, the chart on the right, which shows year on year changes in consumer spending, we saw a 23% drop in consumer spending in the UK, followed by a surge in consumer spending the following year. And this is the first example of what I call the whiplash chart. Um, COVID, as it went through the economy, caused this whiplash in spending, GDP, growth, jobs, and that whiplash is the after effects of that whiplash are really the source of all the problems that we're seeing now. So consumer spending dropped and then bounced back. Consumer spending shifted from services to goods. People stopped buying their Starbucks coffee. They stopped uh, buying their um, sandwiches in Pret. Uh, and they stopped going to the cinema and the theatre and they stopped travelling in taxis um, and they stopped travelling on trains. And they, rather than buying a barista coffee in a cafe, they bought an espresso machine and pods and they, and they, they drank coffee at home, shifting from services to goods. 
And of course, that has a big effect on the economy as well, because services require lots of people to be employed. Um, so a huge contraction in parts of the labor market, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, if the governments around the world did nothing, this would have produced an economic catastrophe. Um, governments fortunately recognized that very quickly and intervened quickly and strongly. So government spending surged mainly on two things. First of all, a huge increase in health spending, um, both in short term health spending, caring for the many people who were very ill with COVID and um, medium term spending on developing and then rolling out the vaccines. So a huge effort in, on health, but also a huge effort on economic stimulus, um, furlough payments, um, various different um, subsidies to stop people um, <clears throat> from, uh, from going under. Um, the biggest stimulus of all was in the US where um, the stimmy checks that, uh, that were issued to people um, are still working their way through the US economy and are one of the big reasons for the inflationary surge that we've seen. So this was the biggest increase in spending, um, certainly in the UK since World War II. Um, kind of ironic that the Conservative government, which has always been, uh, the Conservative government in the UK has always been the, the party of um, uh, fiscal prudence, um, that party oversaw the, the biggest splurge of spending since, uh, since the Labour government post-World War II. And that produced, as I say, the next whiplash that, that, that ripped through the, the, the economy. Um, the initial contraction of the economy that we saw when COVID hit was extraordinary. Um, uh, <clears throat> I managed to get hold of GDP data estimates for the UK going back to 1600. Um, and according to those estimates, the 2020 recession was the sharpest recession for over 600 years in the UK. The only one that rivals it was around about the time of the English Civil War. Um, and it was followed by the strongest recovery for over 200 years. As I say, an extraordinary whiplash, a very deep but very short recession, followed by a, a very strong surge. Now, currently, um, it looks as if the UK economy is moving into recession. Um, GDP figures at the moment are still estimated figures, but it looks like we might be slightly into recession in the UK. Um, and the current forecast here is for a possibly quite long but shallow recession but as you'll see in a bit i think the the better answer is nobody really knows different economies around the world are are proceeding at different speeds but we are seeing a slowdown and it could be that 23 23 we'll see a global recession seems quite possible um now um the next whiplash that we need to deal with is in the jobs market um when covid hit despite the furlough payments and the attempts to stop companies shedding jobs, there was a surge in redundancies in the UK economy and in many economies around the world, because many businesses went under. Um, we seen, we've seen, we saw it with, you know, starting with shops and cafes closing temporarily, and then um, retail outlets closing certain outlets for good, and then some companies simply going under. Um, but as I say, the huge surge in government spending um, meant that um, uh, there was a very strong rebound once lockdown was released. Um, and that led to a surge of hirings. And in fact, we now find ourselves in the position where we have record numbers of vacancies in many of the developed economies. Um, I, I believe, for example, in the US, in many, many cities, two to four, uh, there are two to four vacancies for every unemployed person. Similarly, here in the UK, um, it's really quite hard, hard to, to find people to fill jobs. Um, that's been caused partly by the 
big surge in economic growth, but also by the change in the mix of spending and the change in the mix of jobs that are needed. Um, so if we look at which jobs have seen growth or contraction in employment, we see it's very different for, very di for different sectors. Um, broadly speaking, lots of blue collar jobs have gone here in the UK. So we've seen a contraction in things like farming, mining, construction, retail, hotel, restaurants, fewer baristas, fewer waiters, um, uh, uh, fewer farm labourers and so on. Um, slightly exacerbated, of course, in the UK by Brexit. Um, the one exception has been, broadly speed, speaking, logistics. Um, I think I believe Amazon have hired over a million people in Europe uh, over this period. Companies like Uber and Deliveroo and um, DHL and UPS and so on have been hiring people hand over fist. Um, white collar jobs have mostly done quite well, particularly things to do with IT, anything to do with hybrid working, online shopping, online delivery of anything. Um, HR has been an area of big expansion simply because of the difficulty of coping with all these changes. Uh, but financial services have been one area where there's been a contraction in the white collar sector. But broadly speaking, it's people on lower incomes who have suffered. It's been people, people on lower incomes who've tended to lose their jobs or to, have, or to be laid off or to have their hours reduced. Higher earners have tended to do quite well. Um, they've been much more able to work from home. Um, and that has also meant that many of them have saved money. Um, if you don't have to pay for a, um, a, a rail card, if you don't have to spend money in Starbucks and Costa Coffee and Pret-a-Manger getting your lunch, um, if you don't have the distractions of, of wandering along um, Oxford Street during your lunch, lunch hour, um, people find that they spend, save money working from home and they've saved a lot of money. But that has tended to be in the white collar sector. So what that's mean is that people who are at the bottom end of the income spectrum, uh, particularly people in quintile number two, um, not the very poorest, but the, the near poor, if you like, have tended to be worse off, you know, the waiters and the baristas. Um, whereas people at the upper echelons of, of, of the income spectrum have tended to do quite well. Overall, and this is something which people haven't really drawn as much attention to as they should, overall, we find that people have saved money. Household savings have surged in a way, in the strongest wave of saving in the UK since they started measuring it in 1963. And in the US, the savings surge is way, way bigger um, because of the extraordinary generosity of the, the fiscal stimulus there. So the guilty secret is, while some people have been worse off, most of us are better off. And actually, the richer half of the, of the population is, has been doing quite nicely. Thank you. And that meant that when uh, lockdown was released and people were able to go out and spend money again, there was an extraordinary surge of what you might call revenge shopping. Uh, what has been called revenge shopping. And we see that money, that spare cash, surging into all sorts of unexpected places. 2021 was really the year of the extraordinary post-pandemic surge with that, as I said, the, the strongest economic growth for 200 years, money sloshing into things like day trading. Remember the, um, the whole thing about... Um, GameStop and uh, and um, and the Robin Hood uh, day trading um, controversies, the surge go of money going into crypto for a while. Um, we see we saw interestingly price elasticities falling in many categories, at least in the US, a sign that basically at least in 2021 and early 2022, people have more money than cents. And we saw money going into things like jewellery, watches, restaurants, holidays, luxury goods, um, this huge surge in spending. Now, that surge in spending hit the, the global economy 
just as the labour market contracted. The Great Resignation. What we see is that in the UK, for example, 1.4% of, of, of the labour market dropped out. This chart shows economic inactivity, the proportion of people in the economy who are not working, not looking for work, um, not in the labour market. And as soon as COVID hit, people began to drop out of the labour market. Now, um, who are those people and what are they doing? There are some young people. Um, I, some uh, young people went into education. Uh, some people took, decided to do an extra year of study, to do a master's, to do an extra training course, to, to, to do some kind of education rather than go into the labour force. Those people would jo join the labour force eventually. Um, there, there's been a big increase in sickness. Part of that is long COVID, um, but also, at least here in the UK, many people are sick because of other problems with the healthcare system. Uh, COVID meant that many routine operations and treatments had to be delayed. Waiting lists here in the UK are enormous. And that meant that many people with, you know, um, something like a suspicious growth, uh, an arthritic hip, uh, whatever, these people can't get treatment and it's got to the point where they can't work. Um, we've seen a lot of early retirement. People, we, we have obviously this huge demographic surge meant that the baby boomers are either, uh, uh, many of them are at retirement age and many of them saw the state of the economy and thought, well, rather than going next year or in two years time, I might as well go now. But the other big and slightly mystifying thing is that the biggest increase is amongst other people who are not sick, not studying, not retiring, um, particularly older men. Actually, a lot of people around about my age, um, they don't they just basically seem to have jacked it in for a while. Um, it's almost as if they're taking a gap year. Um, and I think this partly um, uh, correlates with the surge in savings and the reduction in household spending. Um, when you've been working for a, from home for a while and you realise that actually you don't need to spend so much money, uh, then you realise you don't need to earn so much money and actually you can have a nicer life uh, doing something else. And um, uh, so a lot of people have downshifted one way or another. Whether or not that's permanent is not clear. Like I say, it could be the equivalent of a geriatric gap year. Um, and some of those people may return to the labour force. But in the meantime, the consequence is inflation. Inflation is caused by a mismatch between supply and demand. And what we have at the moment is a surge in demand uh, at the time when there's a problem, there are problems with supply. Um, we have a problem with supply in that we're, there are, are, there's a shortage of labour. And we have problems in supply in that, for example, China is still not fully open. and you know, the world's workshop is still not working at full tilt. So when demand is greater than supply, prices go up. Uh, current forecast for inflation in the UK is 11% for this year, but it changes every week, practically. Um, for many of the audience, if you're like the people that I work with, many of you are quite young. And, and, and for you, this is completely outside your zone of experience. We've lived in a very low inflation era um, since the 90s, and 11% uh, inflation seems terrifying. It's not. It's a blip. This is UK inflation since 1800. And this shows you what real inflation looks like and how bad it could get. Uh, around about the first, first, first World War, when we had the last major pandemic, in UK inflation reached 25%. Um, in the 1970s, when we had the OPEC oil shock, the last big energy crisis, UK inflation hit 17%. And in the 1970s, which was the last time, which was the second uh, oil shock, the Thatcher-Reagan uh, uh, economic crisis with the, with the revolution in Iran, um, price inflation hit 24%. So where we are now is just a little blip so far. 
Um, now, it varies a lot by country, and some other countries give us a hint of where it could go. For example, Turkey has inflation of 80% or more, similarly Argentina. So it's very important to get inflation under control and central banks are right to act. Um, but again, different sectors have different inflation rates and it's important to understand the inflation rate in your sector if you're a client. In the UK, for example, anything to do with energy sees prices going through the roof. Um, we Gas prices have doubled here in the UK. Whereas, for example, uh, in a sector like, um, for example, alcohol, um, for some reason, inflation rates are really quite low at the moment. So we might not be able to turn the heating on, but at least we can pour ourselves a stiff drink to keep warm. Um, once again, it's the less affluent households that are suffering most because they have their energy bills are the biggest proportion of their household budget. Now, to understand why inflation has surged in this way, it's important to understand how mismatches in supply and demand work. Um, by the way, it's not all about Ukraine. It's not all about the war. Inflation started to pick up way beyond then. In fact, the first signs of inflation started to, to appear in 2020. I'm going to use airlines as a case study. Um, now, as I said, the airline industry saw its biggest slump in demand since World War II and is still only halfway back to, to recovery. Um, airlines acted by contracting the supply side. They stopped ordering new planes. They retired old planes. They grounded 18% of their fleet. They converted passions, passenger planes to cargo planes to help deliver all those Amazon boxes. They laid off staff and crucially, Many pilots were baby boomers who were approaching retirement age and they dropped out. They ran fewer flights for each, each aircraft. So there was a massive contra contraction in capacity. And although, as demand has begun to come back, they have not been able to increase supply back to match demand. So when demand increases faster than supply and when fuel prices are rising as well, the rational solution is to put your prices up. Um, airline air ticket prices in the US, for example, hit in annual inflation of 30 something percent earlier this year. Um, that sort of pattern of demand moving ahead of supply has been seen in many markets around the world. And it's the reason that inflation started to take off. And then the war in Ukraine gave it an extra kick. So, as I say, the correct response for central banks is to try to curb inflation by raising interest rates. And again, for any young person who looks at what's been happening to interest rates, uh, it's quite terrifying. Uh, we've, well, we've moved from a world where money was effectively free to one where now uh, the latest uh, rate rise here in the UK, interest rates have gone up to 3%. But again, that's nothing. This is UK base rates since 1800. And as you can see, the real outlier is, is what's been happening recently. Um, the recent period um, since, since the last financial crisis has seen the lowest interest rates for 300 years. A normal interest rate for the UK is more like about 4.6%. That's the average since 1800. Um, so it seems highly likely that interest rates are going to go higher than they, are, they currently are and will probably stay higher for a while, while. Let's hope that they don't get as high as they did during the last oil shock um, that's around, around about sort of 1979, 1980, when interest rates hit 17% here in the UK, because uh, if interest rates get up to that level, um, people with mortgages are going to go under. Um, now, um, when you're thinking about the cost of capital, and I will come back to that in the second part of this uh, presentation, um, interest rates are the big threat to the economy, but also perceptions of risk, because willingness of lenders to give people money is determined both by interest rates and perceived risk. And as well as a, a, an interest rate shock, 
we're facing an uncertainty shock. Uncertainty can be measured in a number of different ways. One way is to look at volatility indices like the VIX um, or uh, volatility, volatility in bond market yields. Both those measures of volatility have surged to very high levels recently. But another way of looking at it is to look at professional forecasters and the dispersion in their forecasts, the degree to which they agree on what, with one another on what's going to happen next. The Philadelphia Fed produces this uh, tracking measure on forecasting uncertainty. And what you can see is that professional forecasters have never been as in so much disagreement about the prospects for the world economy. To put it bluntly, they don't know what's going to happen yet next. They haven't got a clue. So with high interest rates and high uncertainty, investors are pulling their money out of risky investments. Um, crypto is um, you know, probably the riskiest and, uh, and the most obvious example. Um, some might say it's a bit of a Ponzi scheme and it's collapsing. But even good old respectable tech stocks have seen their prices collapse. The Nasdaq is way down on where it was because tech stocks are a risky gamble on future profits. Many tech companies either don't make money at all. Many of them are loss making. Uber, for example. Or they don't make very much money. Um, if you look at Amazon's retail business, it does make a profit, but its profit margins are quite meagre. Um, and many companies have only just turned into profit and their profits could be quest questionable. Um, Tesla, for example, the world's most valuable car company, sells actually very few cars and has only recently started making money from selling cars. And there are questions about where their profits come from. A high proportion of their uh, profits, I believe, come from selling carbon credits rather than cars. Investors are voting with their feet and they are moving out of risky investments. Um, we've, seen, we've seen, as I say, tech stocks falling. We've seen um, bond prices falling and gilt yields rising. Um, and partly as a result of that, Liz Truss has gone from being uh, prime minister of the UK to being an answer in a pub quiz, as the economist rather wittily said recently. Um, so money's moving out of uh, low profit, high risk investments um, and into safe things like cash, commodities um, and solid profitable firms. Boring FMCG companies are a better bet these days than tech stocks. It's interesting to see which sectors will see uh, um, uh, money moving out next. Um, my guess is that corporate debt and property, commercial property, are two areas to watch over the next year. Um, corporate debt, eventually those um, loans that companies give to, to their customers to buy things that they can't afford, those things will come due. So look out at things, things like higher purchase and uh, other financing schemes. And commercial property. I mean, if offices are only at 50% capacity and it doesn't look like it's going to get much higher, sooner or later, um, people are going to start selling office blocks and converting them to other uses. Uh, so watch those sectors next over the next year. What other investments are risky? Advertising is an investment, as we always said and always argued. And if we believe that, then we have to take the consequences because advertising is an investment and it's not necessarily always a safe investment. Um, advertising expenditure correlates with the investment side of the economy and with companies' financial prospects. The IPA's extra, excellent bellwether survey shows that budget revisions tend to follow perceptions of companies' financial uh, prospects. And in tough times, people do tend to cut back on marketing budgets. The cuts haven't started yet, despite the fact that um, business people are increasingly gloomy. But that's basically because, um, partly because of inflation. Um, and we have to brace ourselves for potentially, potentially 
a wave of cutting and we have to be ready to deal with that. And that's what the second part of my presentation is about. So um, it's been a rough ride the last few years. We've had COVID, the, the, um, the biggest pand pandemic for 100 years. We've had supply disruptions, which are ongoing. We've had a change in the way that people work, travel, consume. We've had redundancies. We've had a recession. We've had a shift in a whiplash in interest rates and government spending and a surge in spending as we've recovered. We've had an ongoing health crisis. We've had a saving surge. We've had changes in inequality. We've now got labor, labor shortage. We've had the first war for, for 30 years, which I barely even mentioned, and the first energy shock since the 1970s, um, and record jump in inflation and interest rates. Uh, I think the economy, uh, sorry, the onion summarized it best in two, 2009. It's a great time to be an economist, which is a good joke, but actually it's quite wise. Um, all of us in marketing and business need to be economists now. We need to think like economists. We need to think about economic data. And that's what the second part of the presentation is about. But I'm going to shut up for a few minutes to answer a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, as you might expect, we've had quite a few questions. So as I said at the start of this, we'll, we'll just spend four or five minutes uh, trying to answer some of these questions uh, if we can, and then we'll have a five minute break. So let me, let me get, I'll be the question master if you like, let me get straight sure. into it. Um, one of the first questions was um, whether or not the size of your brand might influence the way you navigate these uncertain times. Um, I mean, for example, if you have a small brand, um, would you behave differently to if you were managing a juggernaut brand? Probably, but I have, I have to say I haven't thought that uh, that one through. Um, um, big brands do have an advantage in this situation. Um, in general, big brands um, have economies of scale in marketing. Um, it's a persistent finding from our work with the IPA data, data bank is that big, big brands tend to have the have the upper hand and that's particularly true in tough times um uh, often when the economy contract contracts it's the bottom tier brands that go under um so it's a particularly dangerous time for them um i think it partly depends on whether they're small because they're small and new and um innovating which if you if you're an innovator this can be a time when you can take advantage of the situation and brands that launch during economy uh, during recessions and get through it tend to be brands that that really do well in subsequent years. The people who are in most danger are the uh, mature but small brands who are in, in big danger. Um, I, I, can, I can't give you any specific advice apart from look at the things that we said in effective, effectiveness in context um, about how small brands should behave in normal times. Okay, thanks. Um, I think also your comments about um, peak social um, being um, past us now uh, drew quite a lot of interest. Um, and I think one I, guy Peter's asked a question about TikTok because I think they don't share their information and that's been growing like topsy, of course. Yeah, um, and that's what everyone says. And that's what said, people said two years ago when I said this. Um, TikTok is audited in the data source that I'm looking at because it's the IPA touchpoint server. So we are covering that. Um, yeah. Okay, that, that helps, I think, clear that up a bit. Um, you, asked, <laughs> you asked people to think about your fish question. Do you want to answer that for us? Yep. Uh, restaurants closed. Um, restaurants are important buyers of, of fish. People aren't that confident about cooking fish at home. It's a thing that they quite like to, to buy when they go out to dinner, uh, they, whether it's to the, uh, to the fish and chip shop or to some fancy restaurant. Um, so uh, when the restaurants closed, the price of fish fell dramatically. Uh, people weren't getting their fix of cod at, um, uh, when they went out of the house. So actually people went, oh, well, they started buying fish at home. Um, and they did it until the restaurants reopened at which point the price of fish went up and they, start, they went back to buying it. 
out of the out of the home. Musical instruments. Uh, lots of people took up education and self improvement during COVID, but you only buy a piano once. <laughs> okay, um, just a couple more. Um, Chris Goldson was very interested in your the, the amount of emphasis you put on the working from home stats. I mean, he wondered whether or not. That's a slight London bias. Um, uh, no. Oh, OK. You, uh, so the Google mobility data is national, not London. Um, uh, the the uh, workplace canteens is national, not London. Um, the Lord Mayor's report that I mentioned is London. Um, but uh, and it is different depending on um, sector around the world. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But um, but no, it's not a not just a London thing. Great. Okay. Um, well, I think um, some of the questions are very particular and probably not the best place to to try and try and deal with them now. Um, I think I'm just skipping through them quickly. Um, here's one: um, Do we see any notable companies defying the trends that you've been talking about? Are there some real winners out there that we could look at and learn from? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, uh, you know, there are definitely winners, uh, you know, Zoom. <laughs> um, uh, we've seen a um, um, big surge in um, all sorts of things which are to do with this online way of living, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, video streaming, grocery delivery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, uh, to be honest, it's too complicated to draw any simplistic lessons. But um, in the second half, I will give some general principles of how one should proceed. And maybe that will answer some of those questions. Um, there was another question um, uh, about the climate crisis and how that might uh, have a role in all of the turmoil that we're uh, experiencing or not. I don't know if you have a point of view on that. Um, well, again, mostly that's a long term thing. And this is kind of, you know, um, more short to medium term. Um, it does interact with the energy crisis, clearly. So um, the shift away from fossil fuels has made things worse in some areas. So, for example, um, the fact that um, uh, Germany has um, moved away from coal and nuclear has meant that they've become more reliant on Russian gas, uh, which has made the problems associated with Ukraine worse. Um, so um, in general, the attempts to shift away from fossil fuels have made the economy more vulnerable to the war in Ukraine. But on the other hand, the fact that so far it's been a mild winter means that the um, the effect of energy prices has not been as bad as it could be because people haven't had to put the heating on. Again, it's complicated. Um, okay, one, one last question before we have a break. Um, this is from Chris Stevens, who works in qualitative market research. He's saying that in everything he's doing at the moment, this cost of living crisis is coming up in pretty much every focus group. Yeah. He's wondering whether, uh, from based on previous recessions and crises that we've learned from, if you have any thoughts on how brands should acknowledge and navigate this in their communications. Now, I think you might be talking about that in the next section, but- I'm gonna to be talking about price in the next section um, uh, and, and the importance of it. Exactly what brands should say about it, I'm not sure. Um, um, yes, it's a more, I'm, I'm gonna be talking more about the economics of this without delving into the content of what people should say. And I think that's, um, really a, a a conversation for another day perhaps a, another you could you could easily do a whole another section on that session on that afterwards great okay let's look um we need to keep to time so um what i'd like to suggest now is that everybody has a five minute break we're going to start again uh in five minutes time so let's let's say that uh 25 25 to 12 so yep. if everyone can um use the time as they wish. We'll see you all back in five minutes.